Good morning. It's good to see everyone here this morning. I want to welcome you. If you're visiting with us, thank you for being here. We appreciate your attendance. You're our honored guest. We uh, encourage you, if you have any questions regarding anything said or done here that you ask, we're more than happy to give you a Bible answer to a Bible question, but we're glad you're here. To those who are joining us on Facebook and YouTube, we're also glad you're here. And again, if you have any questions, just write them in the comment section below the feed that you're watching. We'll be happy to give you a Bible answer to a Bible question, but we're glad you're here. A few announcements before we get started. You can probably smell it when you walk through the door, but, uh, and I don't want you to be distracted during the sermon, but there's some really good food back here, and uh, we're going to have a get-together after uh, worship this morning. Everyone is invited to stay and uh, have a, a lunch with us, and to those members, obviously, we want all of you to stay, but uh, the ladies' council has done a wonderful job at preparing there are, as we speak, women back there still doing stuff, and so it will be a wonderful lunch, but we ask you to stay and enjoy some fellowship and friendship and enjoy having a meal together. Also, if you're visiting with us, let me encourage you to pick up a Bible. We want to give you a free Bible. Uh, there's one in front of you on the chairs in front of you, or you can ask one of our greeters, and they'll be happy to give you a free Bible, but we want you to take it with you. Uh, inside that Bible, as well as on the bulletin, you're going to see a QR code. You can scan that code with your camera and your phone, and it will take you to a very special place on our website that gives you more information regarding the church and what we actually believe here and what we teach. So if you would, make sure that you pick up a Bible. That's on us. Uh, also, don't forget that we have a ladies' Bible class every Wednesday at 1145 to 1245, we want to encourage the ladies to attend that if you possibly can. Don't forget about the first Saturday of each month. The men get together for a men's breakfast. We solve all the problems of the world. We just can't get the nations of the world to listen to us yet, but we're working on it, you know. Uh, we have steak and eggs. I'm just kidding. We just have donuts, but still uh, muffins top it off, but we'd love to have you come. Uh, if you're a member of this church, be there for the men's breakfast. Don't forget those who are on our prayer list. We have a number of people that are in need of prayer. And don't forget to pray for the people uh, in uh, Buffalo that uh, had a tragedy strike yesterday with a shooter. So 10 families lost loved ones, and three others are probably praying very hard. Remember those people in your prayers. Let me ask you if you would to bow with me and let's go to God in prayer. Our Father, we're so very thankful for the privilege of being here in this place to be able to come together as your family and worship you in spirit and in truth. We pray, Lord, you'll empty our hearts and minds of anything that might stand between us and our worship of you. Cleanse our hearts, cleanse our souls. We thank you for the one who came and hung on a cross that we might be cleansed, that we might be pure. We can never repay you, but we will praise you forever. Be with us now as we enter into this worship service. Let our worship be in spirit and in truth. To those who are joining us on Facebook and YouTube, we, we Father, we ask that they might join with us in worshiping you. We thank you for loving us. We thank you for the cross and the one that hung there. And it's in his beautiful name we pray. Amen. Let me ask you if you would to stand for the reading of scripture. Scripture reading this morning is um, Matthew 7, 24, 25. Therefore, who, whoever hears these things of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the, one, uh, uh, and the rain descended and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon the, on that house, and it did not fall, for it was found on the rock.
For great is your love reaching to the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Psalm 57 verse 10. The shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Psalm 23, verse 4.
loving kindness, O oh Lord, extends to the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Psalm 36, verse 5. Pleasant morning, everyone. As we pause to share a Lord's Supper meditation, I wanted to turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 2, verse 42 to 44. 
Acts chapter 2, verse 42 through 44. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. Verse 44, and all those who had believed were together and had all things common. Here ends a portion of God's holy word, may we say. Amen. Amen. As a little boy growing up, there are some fundamentals that would stick with you. And in fact, as you grow and as you learn, there are some fundamental concepts in life that you hold on to. One of the dearest ones that I remember very well is take off your shoes before you take off your pants. And for some reason, I kept doing that very often. I tried removing my pants with my shoes intact, and it was never very successful. And, and as I grew up, I understood the concept that it's important to remove your shoes before your pants. Now, as simple as it sounds, there are some fundamental truths in life that we got to hold on to. And I saw the theme on the bulletin, and I smiled because I'm happy because we have to stick to the fundamentals. And so in Acts 2, verse 42, it shares a very powerful set of words. It says they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Now, steadfastly here refers to a constant, resolute conviction, always abounding. And so we're here to partake of what represents the Lord's body and blood, not because of a ritual, not because we feel like we should do it, but we are doing it because it's a part of the apostles' doctrine. It's a part of the teaching. And there's a list that goes on. It's the doctrine, it's the teaching, it's the fellowship, it's the breaking of bread, it's prayer. And so as we have this opportunity to break bread, as we have this opportunity to renew our lives and renew life and life more abundantly, let us consider the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. Let us consider this wonderful opportunity that we can partake in remembrance of what he has done for us. And so we have this opportunity to have a self-examination. Go ahead and examine yourselves. You don't have to share the score with anyone. But when you finish and you examine yourselves, the Bible says, let us eat. And so as I pray, I urge you all to continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Let us continue, even though the truths that are out there may vary. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Let us be praying. Our Father and our God, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that we're not diluting it, we're not fixing it to please ourselves, but we share the word as is and how it was given. We pray, O Lord, for your blessing that as we partake of what represents your body and your blood, we will do so unto life and life more abundantly. We pray, O Lord, for this fellowship, for the worship, for the words that will go forth, for the breaking of bread, for prayers, that we will always abound in your way and in your will. And help us to do it, Lord, regardless of what's happening around us, regardless of what's happening with us, regulatory or government, that we will stick to our truth. We will speak our truth. We'll be humble with it, and we will share it. Pray, O oh Lord, that we'll be resolute, always abounding, knowing, O oh Lord, that this is where life is. Pray, O oh Lord, for your blessings today. Watch over us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we'll be partaking, there are one, two, three stations. Go ahead and make your way and partake. If you're a visitor sharing with us, go ahead and partake if you're a born believer.
I forgot to mention earlier, there's a newsletter for Crossway Missions on the credenza on the right as you're leaving. We're still plugging away at missions. I thank the eldership for allowing me time to work on the podcast and the radio station. And as of this morning, the podcast has downloaded 200,000 sermons. So, But there's a report in there regarding the work in Africa, which this church actually supports via Crossway Missions. So let me encourage you to pick one out uh, up on your way out, and you will be informed. Some things are just simple. In England, there's a, a stone that hangs. It's called John's Weather Forecasting Stone. It is right 100% of the time. If the stone is wet, it is raining. If the stone is dry, it is not raining. If the stone is on, or if the shadow is on the ground for the stone, it is sunny. If it's white on the top, it's snowing. If you can't see the stone, it's foggy. If the stone is swinging, it's windy. If the stone is jumping up and down, there's an earthquake. And if the stone is gone, there's a tornado. I like that hanging stone idea. Most things are pretty black and white. If it's raining, you'll need an umbrella. If the fish are biting, you need a fishing pole. If your car stops and the gauge is on E, you're out of gas. If the report card has bad grades, young people listen, wasn't your fault. If the football team loses, it was bad refs. Most things in the Bible are actually pretty easy to understand. Now, I realize there's some tough stuff in there that scholars have spent their life studying, but I think a lot of times what we do is we make things harder than they need to be. One person actually did an in-depth study and came to the conclusion that Jesus actually spoke on about a seventh grade level to where a seventh grader could understand him. Mark Twain once said, It ain't those parts of the Bible that I can't understand that bother me. It's the parts that I do understand. Let me tell you what. When the Bible says repent, guess what it means? Repent. When the Bible says confess Christ before men, guess what it means? Confess Christ before men. When the Bible says be baptized, guess what it means? Be baptized. We a lot of times make things more difficult than they need to be. Today I want to talk to you about some simple truths that Jesus spoke in a four-line section of the, good, uh, the Sermon on the Mount. In verses 24 through 27 of Matthew, the seventh chapter, he said, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him unto a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the wind blew and beat on that house. And it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, the flood came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. In these four simple verses, there are a number of simple truths. The first truth that we can see easily, the storms. Life brings storms. Listen, we live in a broken world. You can turn on the news every night. You can see that. You can open up the bulletin and see our sick list and realize that we live in a broken world. Some storms, some storms will enter your life so severely they will rock your world to the very core. I watched both my maternal grandparents have to face the end of their lives with a word that we hear far too often, that word, cancer. I've known people in my ministry, I've known people who have lost both a spouse and their jobs in the very same week. Millions of Jews today are still haunted by the memory of a madman who was able to rise to power and destroy six million of their countrymen. And even this morning, there are ten families in Buffalo, New York, who will tell you yes. The storms come completely unexpected. 
the storms in life are real. But Jesus, we have words from him to help us understand that he is there for us. In John 16 and verse 33, he says, In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. In Romans the 12th chapter, verses 9 through 15, Paul said, Let brotherly love, or let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation. Continuing instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity of saints, given to hospitality. Bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep. The storms of life will come. It's been said that you are either coming out of a storm, going into a storm, or in the midst of a storm. That's a simple truth. But we can handle the storms of life. Actually, we need to handle the storms of life. It is a defining mark of our character. When something bad happens in your life, you have three choices. You can let it define you. You can let it destroy you. Or you can let it strengthen you. The storms in our life often clarify who and what we are. But the storms will come. And we cannot shape the storms. But we can prepare for those when they arrive. But that brings me to the next point of this lesson. Simple truths. The storms will come. But those that respond accordingly are smart. Now... The word smart, from Luke's account, in Luke the 6th chapter, verses 47 through 49, he doesn't even use the word smart. He doesn't call them wise. He doesn't call them smart. Why? It's a simple truth. Their house stands. Their house stands when the storm comes. That makes them smart. That makes them wise. The Greek word for wise that's used in Matthew is proronymos. It means one who is wise, sensible, prudent, thoughtful as in a thinker, Cautious, practical, intelligent, mindful of one's interest. Now listen, Greek Greek words shed a lot of light on stuff, but let's not make it more complicated than it needs to be. Basically, in this short little segment that Jesus mentioned, he hears and he acts. That's what makes him wise. That's what makes him smart. If you hear that an IPO is about... To go public, it's an upstart company. It's going to be on the New York Stock Exchange. It's going to start at 25 cents per share. But it's expected by the end of its first day of sharing to go to $100 per share. You're going to act on that because a $1,000 investment will yield you $400,000 by the end of the day. You might want to check my math. I'm no good with math. But if you get that information and it is insider information, don't act on that. Because you might end up in jail. Jesus said, therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man who built his house upon a rock. He's wise because he hears, but he's wise because he hears and does. Jesus also said that the wise man can actually be you. Whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them. Listen. The sum, substance, and totality of Christianity is commandment keeping. Now, some of you may be sitting there going, wait a minute, that sounds like legalism to me. Well, if the modem for commandment keeping is the wrong motive, if it's to just put God into your debt to make him owe you, that he's indebted to you because you've done all these things that he says, then yes, that's the wrong motive. But I'm not talking about commandment keeping from an inferior motive. I'm talking about commandment keeping from the motive of love. And when that is the motive, the sum, substance, and totality of Christianity is commandment keeping. And if you don't believe me, at least believe Jesus. Only hours before the cross, hours before they will nail him to that Roman cross with coal Roman steel through his hands and through his feet. He said to his disciples in John 14 and verse 15, If you love me, keep my commandments. In 1423, if a man love me, he will. Keep my words. 1424, he that loveth me not, keepeth not my sayings. 
Jesus points out that the motive for commandment keeping must be love. And John points out as he writes that closing book of the Bible in that closing chapter. In Revelation chapter 22 and verse 14, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. John actually says that those who keep the commandments of Christ get to go to heaven. Now we know that no legalist is going to go to heaven. Therefore, commandment keeping from the motive of love cannot be legalism because those who keep his commandments from the motive of love go to heaven. That's smart. And that's exactly what Jesus is saying. The bottom sign, the bottom line is foresight. I heard a story about a man who was walking along a beach. And he stumbled across a, a bottle that was half buried in the sand. Yeah, this is one of those genie jokes, so just hold on. He picked it up, he brushed off the sand, and a genie popped out. And the genie said to him, you have one wish. And the man said, one wish? One wish? Most, most genies give three wishes. He said, listen, I'm the Kmart blue light special genie. You get one wish. That's all you get. If you know what I meant by that, you've just told me your age. The man thought long and hard. What could he wish for? He finally decided he was a Wall Street trader. And he said, I want a copy of next year's local newspaper with stock quotes. The genie said, done. Boom. Instantly he had his hands on a copy of the local newspaper for the next year. He went home and he studied it for hours. He plotted the current price of stocks here and what they would be a year from there. He did a whole spreadsheet. He worked and he worked and he worked and he finally got it all worked out. And by the time, by that time next year, he would be a millionaire. And when he was done, he picked up the paper. He threw it down on the table. It fell open to the obituaries and his was the first name on the list. The wise man knows that the storm is coming. He's prepared. He has foresight. He's readied himself. He's built his house on a solid foundation. There's a storm coming for you. And that storm, if Jesus tarries, is death. Because your name is going to be in that obituary. My best friend that I studied with all through Harding. We would stay up all night and study, and we'd lost contact over the years. A few weeks back, I decided to look him up and see what he was up to and send him a text message. When I went to his Facebook page, he was two years younger than me. It was his obituary. He's on the other side. The storm is coming to sweep us into eternity. If Jesus tarries, that storm will come and it will take us all to stand before an almighty God. The question is, will you be wise when you stand there? That brings me to the next point of this lesson, the stolid. Now let me define stolid. It's not a word that we use all the time. It's not easily stirred or moved mentally and passive. The Latin, it actually comes from stolidus. It means inert, dull, stupid. Now, bluntly, using that word stupid, for some of you get mad at me, all right, and say, hey, we don't like you using bad words in the pulpit. And I've heard some of you say something probably just about the bad. But the Bible uses that term. The New King James Version, Proverbs 12 and verse 1, whoever loves instruction loves knowledge, but he who hates correction is stupid. Psalms, the 49th chapter, verse 10, for he sees that even wise men die, the stupid and the senseless alike perish and leave their wealth to others. That's New American Standard. Jeremiah 10, 21, for the shepherds have become stupid and have not sought the Lord, therefore they have not prospered and all their flock is scattered. Jeremiah 4 and verse 22, For my people are foolish, they know me not. They are stupid children, they have no understanding. They are wise in doing evil, but how to do good, they know not. So when I use the term scriptural, I'm not just trying to be blunt, uh, use the term stupid, I'm trying to be scriptural. Jesus calls this man a foolish man. Everyone that hears these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man who built his house upon the sand. I don't know if you know it, but the Greek word for foolish is the Greek word moros. It's where we get our word moron. 
It means dull, a stupid, a blockhead, a fool. So the blunt, simple truth that Jesus is trying to get across, he who hears and does not do is a moron. He's stupid. That stolid person that has something in common, the only thing that he has in common with the one who is wise is the wise man hears and he hears. Verse 24, the wise man hears. Verse 26, the foolish man hears. Both of them hear, but only one accomplishes it. And Christianity is about doing. It's not just about hearing. In Isaiah, the 30th chapter, verses 8 through 10, Isaiah said, Now go, write it before them in a table, note it in a book, that it may be for the time to come forever and ever, that this is a rebellious people, lying children, children that will not hear the law of the Lord, which say to the seers, See not, and to the prophets, prophesy not unto us right things, but speak unto us smooth things, prophesy deceits. Now that's King James. It's a little rough, all right? Let's read it from the contemporary English version. The Lord told me to write down his message for the people so that it would be there forever. They have turned against the Lord and can't be trusted. They have refused his teaching and have said to his messengers and prophets, don't tell us what God has shown you and don't preach the truth. Just say what we want to hear, even if it's false. Stop telling us what God has said. We don't want to hear any more about the holy God of Israel. Regretfully, there are people today that say the same things, maybe not with their words, but with their lives. Let me tell you something. Hearing and heeding the words of Christ is about lordship. In Luke, the sixth chapter, verse 46, as Luke records this, this section of scripture that Matthew records and we've read from, that sermon started because Jesus said, And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? That's a rhetorical question. If you don't do what I say, then I'm not your Lord. Let me tell you something. There's a lot of people today in and among us, in our churches as well as many others, who want Christ as Savior. They want him to save them. But they're not willing to have him as Lord. And that is not an option. It's not coffee or tea. Peter would actually say on the day of Pentecost when he preached that first gospel sermon in the name of a risen redeemer, he said in verse 36, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom you crucified both Lord and Christ. You cannot have him as Savior if you are not willing to take him as Lord. And that's a simple truth. Action is the delineating difference in the smart and the stolid. I mean, the stolid, the foolish, the stupid man gets up from the pew on Sunday morning. He goes home. He still honky taunts. He still cheats people out of money. He smokes, cusses, fumes, and fusses. He still lies. He still cheats and steals. He focuses on time and timely things. He never picks up a Bible. He never prays. He's almost the identical man he was before he became a Christian. The word Lord to him means nothing. He doesn't even know it's supposed to. There's no life-changing actions on his life. He does nothing, and in doing so, he builds a house on the sand, and it will fall. And that brings me to the next point of this lesson, the stimulant. The stimulant, actually, Jesus began this short little four-verse parable by saying, Therefore, I've said it in many a classes here, on peak of the week as well as Bible study on Sunday morning. Anytime you see the word therefore, you need to ask the question, what is it there for? It is pointing to something that has been said earlier, most times immediately before. And the story that prompted this story about the wise and the foolish builders is Matthew the 7th chapter, verse 21 through 23. This story about the wise and the foolish builders starts at verse 24 and runs to verse 27. What prompted it? Matthew 7, 21 through 23, Jesus said, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. 
Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works, and then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. When Jesus starts this little bitty sermonette on the wise and the foolish, he says, Therefore, therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man that built his house upon a rock. Now, if you think about this, that 7, 21 through 23 is actually a picture of judgment day. Jesus actually looks down the corridor of time and he sees the day of judgment. He does this on many occasions. He does it here in Matthew 7, 21 through 25. He does it with the five foolish virgins in Matthew 25, 1 through 13. He does it with the parable of the talents in Matthew 25, 14 through 30. He just plain speaks about the judgment day in Matthew 25, 31 through 46. And he talks about it in the great supper in Matthew the 8th chapter, verses 11 and 12. Jesus looks into the future and sees a judgment day coming. And that judgment day for so many will be a storm they will not be able to endure. Why? Because they called Jesus Lord, but they did not submit to his word. Jesus says many people in that day will say, Lord, Lord. Now I want you to, I want you to slow down here because people just, I've, I've watched so many denominational people just run right past this, break this passage down. Be smart, be wise. Lord, Lord, they're talking to Jesus. Many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name. These are Christian age people. They are talking to Jesus who's sitting on the throne of the great white throne judgment and they are saying to him, we prophesied in your name or we thought we did. We exercised demons in, in your name or we thought we did. We did many good things in your name. Let me tell you what, these people are not pew warmers, they're not bench sitters. These people are plugged in, they're active religiously in the name of Christ. But Jesus will say to them, depart from me. I never knew you. You stop and you ask the question, did they believe? When they were on earth, when they were prophesying, when they were exercising demons, or when they were doing many wonderful things, did they believe? Who's going to waste all their time doing this stuff if they don't believe? They are believers. But Jesus will say to them, I never knew you. They had never done what they needed to do to be saved. Why? Because they were lawless. When he says, depart from me, ye that work iniquity, that's King James. The word there in the Greek is antinomia. It means against law. Some preacher, some track, some Bible in some hotel room said, pray a sinner's prayer. Invite Jesus into your heart as your personal Lord and Savior. Congratulations, you're saved. But Jesus differs with that. Because these people, though they believe, though they are religiously active, though they're plugged in and doing more than sometimes we can even boast, Jesus says to them, I never knew you. Someone told them they were saved and they weren't saved. Why? Faith only. It is the greatest deception the devil has pulled among those Protestant churches who wanted to break away from Catholicism and go back to the Bible, but they stopped short. And someone said, you're saved by faith only, and they said, sounds good to me. And they embraced it. Why? Because faith is mentioned more than anything else. But I assure you, God did not put everything concerning the plan of salvation in just faith verses. He also said in Luke 13, 3 and 5, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. He used the same word there that he he uses in John 3 and verse 16, whosoever believes in him should not perish. So Jesus made repentance on the same par as belief by hooking those two together with the word perish. Jesus said, unless you confess me before men, I will not confess you before my Father which is in heaven. Jesus said, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be condemned. That's the plan of salvation according to the Bible. These poor people stand here at judgment thinking everything's okay and find out they did not go to the law of Christ. They did not go back to the book and because they did not go back to the book, because they embraced some false teaching that the world has promised, 
propagated around the globe. Because they embrace that, they find themselves lost at judgment. What does it boil down to? He that heareth my words and doeth them. That's the wise man. The stimulant of the story of the two builders is because of the stomach coming storm of judgment. There's only two groups of people at judgment. Those who heard, those who heeded, those who called him Lord, and it meant something. And then there's the stolid, those who hear, but they do not heed. They called him Lord, but it meant nothing. I've said this before, but it's worth repeating. In Matthew, the 25th chapter, in verses 31 through 46, again, Jesus is talking about that coming judgment day. And he says, when he comes in the glory of his angels and all his angels with him, the angels will separate that vast herd of humanity. Billions. Billions of people will be parted right and left. To those on the right-hand side, he will say, come, you blessed of my father. To those on the left-hand side, he will say, depart from me, you cursed. Every time Jesus speaks of judgment, every time he uses illustrations to point to judgment, there are always those who are ready, the, the five wise virgins and the five foolish virgins. Those who come from the east and the west and sit down at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and those children of the kingdom that are cast out. There's always those who are ready and those who are not ready. And as he speaks in Matthew 25 and looks down the corridor of time to that great judgment day, he sees that vast human crowd of individuals and that only consists of those who are smart and those who are wise. And he talks about how they're parted right and left. When he looked down the corridor of time and saw that event, he saw you. You were there. In the mind of Christ, as he looked forward, in that crowd, you were there. The question for you, which side? Which side did he see you parted to? That's up to you. That's up to you. Your eternal destiny will depend on whether you not only hear the words of Christ, but you do the words of Christ. That is the one simple truth I want to get across in this lesson. So don't play footsies with this. Don't play games with this. Go all in. I guarantee it. A billion, billion eternities from now, you'll be glad that you did. It's worth it. The trade-off is easy. 60, 70, 80, 90 years here. And then you get eternity with God in a place that has no pain, no sorrow, no more death, no more separation. And I don't know about you, but that's where I want to be. Not because of it, but because of Him. Because of the one who hung on a cross to get me there. So the one simple truth, do you hear and obey? Or do you just hear? That's your decision. And even an omnipotent God gives you that prerogative. You choose your decision. Let me ask you if you would to bow with me and let's go to God in prayer. Father, we're so thankful for this short little part of scripture that points so clearly, so easily to these simple truths. Help us to hear. Help us to obey. We thank you for loving us so much that you sent Jesus to die for us. Help us to yield our lives to him as Lord of our lives. Thank you for loving us. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you're here this morning and you need to become a Christian, don't put it off. Become one. Here. Today. If you are a Christian, maybe you've believed, repented, confessed, been baptized, but you've not been faithful. There's still time. God is the God of second chances, third chances, fourth chances. Come back. And if you just need a place to call home, 
a church home and you're a baptized believer, we would welcome you to be a part of this family here at Margate. Whatever your needs might be, we extend an invitation. If you have anything that we can help you with, we're happy to do so while we stand, while we sing. Once again, thank you for being here. Uh, I believe that we're supposed to make our way. I don't know if we should tarry a moment or two, but uh, I believe the tables are numbered, and uh, only the Lord knows which number is going first. So y'all just uh, doesn't matter who you sit. All right. Uh, there's. I don't know if there's a sign seating or anything. I, I'm going to let the ladies council do. No, no sign seat. Okay. All right. Good. Because. Uh, I don't want to get up here and tell you to do something I'm not supposed to do. But stay and eat, especially if you're visiting with us. We'd love to have you, feed you, but uh, we're thankful for your being here. Uh, any birthdays that we need to hit? No birthdays this week? Okay, good. We're good. All right, well, let's have a closing prayer, and then we'll uh, dismiss for lunch. Uh, let me ask uh, Ron. I'm going to ask Ron to go ahead and close us in prayer, but also to ask for a blessing on the food. Father, we thank you for each one that's here this, uh, this day. We ask that uh, each of us will be blessed in a special way in that we've heard your worth pro uh, proclaimed, we've remembered you on the cross, and we look forward to living our lives as being built on a rock, Christ. Be with us now as we go to our uh, next room that we may uh, enjoy the food that is prepared for us. We ask that you'll bless it for its intended use. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen.